Um, so I'm Emma Oxford, Director of Community Relations, and uh, it's wonderful to see so many of you here on this fine evening. Looks like spring is coming, coming. It's been a long time coming. Uh, and we especially welcome members of the Friends of Concordia, and uh, as you know, it's your continued support that helps uh, us to fund these community programs. So as usual, there's a chance to win a signed copy of tonight's book by entering our raffle. And if you didn't fill out a card earlier, please um, raise your hand and we'll try and get one to you in a few minutes' time. Okay, we'll come back to you on that. Um, and at the end of the discussion, join us in the lobby for refreshments and we hope that you'll buy a copy of uh, the book we're discussing and have it signed by the author. Peter Godwin has just published tonight's book, The Fear, Robert Mugabe and the Martyrdom of Zimbabwe. It's his third memoir of the country where he was born and raised. And my husband Mike and I have known Peter for about as long as Robert Mugabe has held power in Zimbabwe, which is over 30 years. Peter put himself at great personal risk to report the fear but he's never been one to shy away from a challenge. When we met in England in the late 1970s, he was studying international relations at Oxford and had already completed a law degree at Cambridge. But when most of us were going straight from high school to college, Peter was drafted into the Rhodesian army to help defend Ian Smith's white minority rule of the country experiences that he wrote about in his first memoir, Mukiwa, which won the George Orwell Prize and was very well acclaimed. After a time practicing human rights law in what was by then the, the new nation of Zimbabwe, uh, Peter became a foreign and a war correspondent, reporting from more than 60 countries including many African nations. He was a highly respected correspondent for, for the London Sunday Times and chief correspondent for a BBC foreign affairs program called Assignment. He also wrote and co-presented a three-part series, Africa Unmasked, for Britain's Channel 4 television. But our paths crossed again about a dozen years ago now when Peter and his wife Joanna Coles, who's also a journalist and is now editor-in-chief of Marie Claire magazine, moved to New York. And since they've settled in New York, Peter has written for many publications, including National Geographic, The New York Times magazine, and Vanity Fair. He's taught writing right here in Bronxville at Sarah Lawrence College, also at the New School in Princeton, and he's taught at Columbia. Just last year, he received a prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship. And in 2007, he published a follow-up to Makiwa, his second memoir of Africa, called When a Crocodile Eats the Sun. And I hope, Peter, you'll explain why it's called that. Uh, tonight is the third installment of his Zimbabwe stories, and it's a really shocking first-hand account of the martyrdom of Zimbabwe at the hands of Robert Mugabe. I've been reading The Fear at Night, and I have to say it's not comfortable bedtime reading. But Peter's extraordinary talent is to tell these uncomfortable tales with humor, emotion, and the most beautiful writing. So welcome, Peter. We look forward to hearing from you. And after you've spoken, we'll have some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you. thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you, Emma, for those kind words. Um, when you hear yourself spoken of in that way with everything you've ever done compressed like that, it's very difficult to recognize the person you really are. It's like, it's like having someone write an obituary of you when you're still alive. <laughs> I should probably explain to you, first of all, why, um, for most people, even one memoir in a lifetime is a bit of a reach. 
Um, and so it's mildly embarrassing to find myself in the position of now having written three first-person um, books. It reminds me of that Woody Allen quote when he said, enough about me, what do you think about me? Um, but these books, um, and, and I, I will just, I, I just have to get this out of the way because I do feel, being, being Anglo, I do feel slightly embarrassed because we're always taught never to boast, so it, it is a little embarrassing. But the reason that I wrote these books in the first person is that for, I'm very conscious that for a lot of readers, what I'm describing is um, <clears throat> relatively exotic. It seems very far away and in strange places. And somehow, if you can, if you insert yourself just enough to take a reader by the hand, you become like a kind of literary safari guide and you can guide them through something and it doesn't seem quite so, so confusing. Um, but having said that, it's been my misfortune in, in some respects to have just lived a very strange life in terms of both geography and chronology. I feel like in many ways um, I grew up in what was the last chapter of, of the British Empire in a sense. I grew up in what was, what, as Emma told you, was still Rhodesia, was white ruled, settler ruled Rhodesia. And my, my parents had emigrated from England after the Second World War. Um, and I was born and, and raised in what was then Rhodesia. And they settled on, in, in a very remote area of Rhodesia on the Mozambique border. And it's a place which confounds any cliches you might have of what Africa looks like, of the savanna and the plains and of dust and that kind of thing. And in, in so far as it's high and well watered and mountainous, it's very verdant. It has orchards and it, ha it grows coffee and tea and, 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 and conifers and it doesn't look like your cliche of Africa. But it was very, very remote and cut off and my mother was the only doctor for hundreds and hundreds of square miles. Um, and it was an extraordinary place and I described what that was like growing up there in, in my first memoir, Mukiwa. Um, and during the course of my childhood, um, white rule came to an end, but, but through a, a, a lengthy and very costly civil war, um, which lasted um, off and on for more than a decade. Um, and I, my parents themselves never really supported Ian Smith, who, was, who became the embattled white settlers leader um, and who tried to resist black rule for as long as possible. But nevertheless, I, I was conscript, conscripted straight from high school and ended up um, spending two years in that war. Again, experiences that I wrote about in, in, in that first book, Makiwa. Um, I then, um, I, I, I left after that to go, as, as Emma said, to, to university in England and came back when I, and when I finally came back, the war was over. Now, in, in Makiwa, what was interesting, after I'd written it, some readers said to me that, my, whereas my mother was a very well-drawn character, she's, she, was this, she was a formidable woman, she's still alive, she is a formidable woman, um, and she was a fantastic doctor and a really rather terrible mother because all, all she cared about were her patients, as one could see. So she rushed around the bush. She was essentially um, a doctor to tribal areas there and she vaccinated, um, did mass vaccinations. She ran leper colonies and TB sanitaria and um, did you know lots of primary health things. But we were eventually shuttled off um, to boarding school. And Mokiba describes a lot of what her job was like. But my father in, in that book is a very remote character, everybody said, He's, and, and indeed he was. He was this sort of rather forbidding Edwardian paterfamilias with a handlebar moustache striding around the bush in a safari suit and, and desert boots and, and sort of was very kind of curt and, and rather scary to even to, especially to, in a sense, his son. Um, and he was, emotionally very truculent. Um, you couldn't just sort of march up to him and ask him personal questions. He had this kind of invisible moat around him. And he was, but for all of that, he was a, he was a sort of quintessential British colonial. He spoke in a, in a clipped semi-military um, um, British accent, a sort of British colonial accent. And 
that was that was how he was described in Makiwa, and that was that. Fast forward a few years later, and the next memoir I wrote was called When a Crocodile Eats the Sun. And When a Crocodile Eats the Sun basically traces um, the, very, the, the very steep decline in Zimbabwe's fortunes that came about from about the year 2000. Um, up until that point, Zimbabwe had been one of the great hopes of Africa, the sort of the, the beacon on the hill. It, it was always the place that was quoted and pointed at to show you just how well Africa could work. It was the, it was the success story. Um, and it really was an extraordinary place. It had the highest literacy rates on the continent. It had one of the highest GDPs. It had fantastic infrastructure. And Robert Mugabe took over in 1980. Uh, and, and, and things had gone relatively well until 2000. Now, when I say relatively, because for me, and this is, I had also written about this in Makiwa, um, I was a young rookie reporter in 1983-84 when Mugabe launched um, a, a military attack on the south of the country, uh, and uh, which is called, in an operation that was called Gukura Hundi. Um, and we think, probably as many as 20,000 civilians were killed in that operation. But it, was, it never received that much publicity. You fast forward to 2000, and the country starts to unravel very, very sharply. Um, and it happens for a number of reasons, which I'm, I'm going to come to. But in, in Crocodile, I describe that, that descent into failed statehood and try and weave it in together with my father's illness, his slow decline as well in parallel with the country's and his, and his ultimate death. And a strange thing happened just before he died, in the, in the year before he died, which is that as he, I think now looking back, as he realized that he was in fact dying, he, um, he put up a picture on the wall of three people I'd never seen before, a sort of young middle-aged couple and a, a, and a what looked like their daughter, about 11 years old, standing between them. Anyway, it turned out that these people were his parents and his, and his sister, and that, in fact, far from being English, my father was a Polish Jew, and his family had been killed in the Holocaust. So, so suddenly, in retrospect, I then started to understand a lot more about him. Um, and, and in the last you know, year of his life, we had this extraordinary exchange where... In fact, what happened was he reintroduced himself to me um, and said to me, you know, my name isn't my real name, um, my background isn't my real background, my biography is, is fictitious, um, and started to tell me who, who he really was. And it's the most extraordinary experience because at that point I was already middle-aged, I had children of my own. Um, it's a very strange sort of slightly perspective shifting um, um, experience to go through. In fact, I think my sister, my younger sister Georgina, um, expressed it best when she said that she felt like it was um, what, what it must be like to find out as an adult that you um, that you were adopted. In other words, your your life as you've lived it since you could remember is still exactly the same. You, nothing changes. You lived the life you did, but your but your origins are something else, and it kind of shifts your perspective by, by several degrees. You look at everything differently. But all sorts of things did kind of fit into place. I mean, most of all, my father's, my father's behavior, certainly. Um, uh, and, and, and it was an extraordinary time because that book, is, 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 it, it's bracketed. It begins and ends with a description of, of my father's... Um, uh, my father's cremation, and what had happened is that he he asked me. He never asked me for anything, and he, uh, he made me promise him one thing before he died, just before he died, which was that when he died, that I would make sure he was cremated. Um, which is a slightly strange thing because that's not in the Jewish um, tradition, actually. But that's what he wanted. So um, I said, sure, I'd do that. And when when he did in fact die, we were so concentrating on trying to organise the funeral, which. By then in Zimbabwe, it was so difficult. There was no fuel. You couldn't get flour to make the cakes. People, you couldn't transport people. You know, we were trying to arrange lifts for everybody. And we were so sort of preoccupied with that that, um, that I, I left the, 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 the details of the cremation to the last minute. Um, and then 
when I uh, and then the phone rang the the day of the funeral and it was the it was the undertakers and they said listen we there hadn't been electricity in the capital Harare then for several weeks this was very common by then there, 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 there were these blackouts or brownouts for often weeks at a time that by then there was no running water the hospitals and schools had collapsed this was a country really in in sort of you know the terminal states of collapse um, and they said there hadn't been electricity for two or three weeks and they had been using their backup generator to keep the, the mortuary chilled and so, so that the bodies didn't um, decompose. And now they had run out of diesel for the generator and so the, so the bodies were warming up and that I needed to come and claim my father's body um, in the next two days or otherwise it would be taken to... Um, a, and it would be buried in a mass grave outside the city limits in a, in a, in a pit, in a pauper's grave. So I, I quickly phoned up the crematorium and said, oh, I need to make a, I need to make a booking. And they said, well, we haven't, had, we haven't had butane gas for a month now and we can't get it. So I struggled to try and get butane, to try and import it privately, to pay in foreign currency and one thing or another. And I just couldn't do it. It, it, it was impossible in, within the time limit. And eventually, in desperation, I phoned up the Zimbabwe Hindu Society and said to them, "I need, to, I, you know, I need to cremate my father. Can you, can you do it for me on a, a Hindu funeral pyre?" And they said, "Well, we, you know, we're we're not allowed to do that unless he's a Hindu. It's against the law. We can't do that." And so. I carried on trying to source butane. And when that was impossible, I called them up again and said, listen, you've really got to help me out here. And eventually they said, well, there is one way around it, which is that if we convert him to Hinduism, I suppose, then we could do it. So the extraordinary thing about my father in the end was that he, he was born a Jew. He lived his life as a Christian, an Episcopalian, and then, and then uh, in, in death he was converted to Hinduism. So I think by then he had all bases covered. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and it was the most extraordinary thing because they said, I said, great, okay, you know, where shall I bring the body? And they said, no, 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 no. You as the oldest son, you have to do it. So I said, well, I have no idea. How do I do that? And they said, well, we'll, we'll you, you come and get the wood and we'll, we'll, we'll give you, some, you know, an assistant and he'll show you. And um, it's actually quite complicated to build a funeral pyre. I mean, the, 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 just from, a, from an arboreal point of view, the wood that you use, you have to sort of alternate fast burning and slow burning wood because basically the idea is that this fire has to burn for 24 hours and ideally you don't you shouldn't have to add wood to it i mean it's something that it should be built in such a way that it can burn straight through for 24 hours um and and so that so we built this funeral pyre and then the the, the undertaker's van drew up and we we delivered my father's body and we we carried it up and put it on top of this thing and then I and and and, and I lit the pyre and then we waited there for for 24 hours and let me tell you that that when you go to a when you go to a modern crematorium and 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 the coffin disappears and there's that sort of whoosh of, 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 of the gas burners and then eventually you're given a little casket with kind of grey powder in it and it's all very, you know, very civilised. That's not what comes out of the end of a funeral pile. Let me tell you, the femur is not a bone that burns uh, quickly and to nothing. So it's a completely different experience. I mean, and it was really an astonishing thing to have to do to to burn your own father and, 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 and in a weird way very, um, very moving, I mean bizarre but kind of moving and, and in some senses appropriate. Now what happened in 2000 essentially, um, I mean the reason, just before I go, the reason I keep writing about Zimbabwe, uh, each time I write a book about Zimbabwe I swear to myself that's the last one, I'm not going to keep writing about a small little Central African country that no one cares about, why would you do it, why would you choose such a tiny canvas, it's like, it's like conducting literary keyhole surgery, I mean there's, there's no reason for it, except that the closer you look at Zimbabwe the more you realise that it, it has become completely symbolic, it's sort of totemic for so many other things. Um, it, it, as I said, to begin with, it, it represented everything that was best about Africa. Then it became a story about, about one man's hubris, about, about really the tyranny of Robert Mugabe as he lost more and more support but refused to go, and how one man in the end 
was prepared to pull the pillars down so that this country you know, collapsed on top of everybody rather than move out of the way. Um, but it also became, and so the, the plot line is, is, is really dramatic. I mean, it's a sort of, it's, it's worthy of Shakespeare in that sense. There are scenes out of it, and indeed this book, that remind me of the plot of King Lear, for example. I mean, it's, it's, it's like that in its, in its magnitude. And it's also, it's also a tragedy in the truly classical sense of it, in that, in that it, it, it is so easily avoidable, and yet there's this sort of terrible sense of inevitability as you go, as you go through it. Um, and that's why I keep going back there. But the people in Zimbabwe are also are also extraordinary. The the, the Zimbabweans themselves have shown um, amazing um, fortitude. And really, the reason that I write about I keep writing about them is because they are they are so inspiring. But this particular book is an accidental book. I I was sent to Zimbabwe in 2008 by Vanity Fair magazine because what had happened was Mugabe is not like other dictators. Again, you know, here's somewhere where we defy the cliche. He's not some Idi Amin, um, the heavyweight champion, uh, boxing champion of the King's African Rifles. He's not some Nigerian medal-strewn general. He's, he's an intellectual. He's someone who was original, originally a liberation leader. He was, he was voted in democratically originally, and he enjoyed inhabiting the, the moral high ground. And it's something that, so as a result, he still goes through the, um, he, still, he still goes through the, the kind of window dressing of democracy. He still has elections, but, he, but these elections are only okay as long as he wins. So he makes sure he does. He fiddles them, he cheats them, he intimidates, he does whatever's necessary. But in 2008, the, the public sentiment in Zimbabwe had grown so much against him that even with all of that cheating, he, he lost control of those elections and it looked like he was, going to, he was going to lose. And for a dizzying period that ended up being only really two or three weeks, it looked like he was finally at the end of his career. He was already, he'd already been in, in office for almost 30 years. He was 84 years old and it looked like it was drawing to a close. And under those circumstances, I flew out to Zimbabwe thinking that I was in effect going to be dancing on Mugabe's political grave. And just let me read you this paragraph so that you understand just how, how, how bad things have become in Zimbabwe and why the Zimbabwean electorate had turned against him. Zimbabweans have many reasons to reject him. Once they enjoyed the highest standard of living in Africa, now their money is nearly worthless, halving in value every 24 hours. Only 6% of workers have jobs. Their incomes have sunk to pre-1950 levels. They are starving. Their schools are closed, their hospitals collapsed. Their life expectancy has crashed from 60 to 36. They have the world's highest ratio of orphans. They are officially the unhappiest people on earth, and they are fleeing the shattered country in their millions, an exodus of up to a third of the population. So that's how bad things had got. Now, we waited around for several weeks, but they wouldn't announce the results. So although we knew he'd lost, they wouldn't officially announce the results. And while we were waiting, my younger sister Georgina and I decided to go to visit, to go on a road trip and visit Chimani Mani, the area, the area where we had grown up, and um, where there was a bizarrely a little music festival. And on our way back from that to the capital Harare, as we were driving along at dusk, we started to see wheelbarrows, people pushing wheelbarrows off to the side of the road. And Georgina made a kind of, you know, a, a kind of attempt at humor and said, boy, this is how bad public transport has now got. You have, to, you have to rent a wheelbarrow instead of a taxi because there are no buses, there's no fuel, that's how you get from A to B. And it was only when we got back to the capital that we realized that what we were actually seeing were the first victims of what was a a campaign of torture against opposition members on an industrial scale, that this is what Mugabe's people, what his generals had decided to launch instead of accepting, uh, accepting their political fate. They had decided that, that they, would, they would fight back. And it took some time to, to realize what was going on, largely because um, 
because all the foreign correspondents had been thrown out. Many of the local journalists were in hiding. The leaders of the opposition, most of them had fled the country because their lives were in danger. So it was very, very difficult in real time to work out what was going on. But partly because my mother had trained many of the nurses in, in Zimbabwe, because she was later a doctor at one of the main hospitals there and looked after a lot of the nurses there. Um, I went into some of the private hospitals. Um, and I want to read you this little bit just to show you really what I found when I, when I started going into those hospitals and, and why I decided to stay at that point. <clears throat> White man's flesh marks easily. It is a pale canvas on which the path of pain is easily painted, but it takes a lot more to mark a black man. Somehow the palette of black wounds seems more violent, tearing down through the dark skin into the yellow curd of subcutaneous fat, the red gristle of muscle fibers down to the shocking whiteness of bones. In Ward 1S, we catch up with Mr. Corrick, a Yugoslav orthopedic surgeon who has never been so busy. What he is seeing mostly now is what he calls defense injuries. It's a chilling phrase, one the doctors use to describe the shattering damage caused to your arms when you hold them up over your head in an effort to protect yourself from the blows. The blows of the boot, the blows of the log, the blows of the whip, the blows of the rock, the machete, the axe. Now Mr. Corrick has run out of the metal plates and pins he uses to set shattered arms and legs so he can no longer operate other than to clean up the shards of bone. He doesn't know what else to do. I can't just discharge someone with fractured tibias, he says, head in hands. In Ward 1S2 are C. Mutekele and Happiness Mutata, Nurse Georgie goes to their bed ends and takes a quick look at their charts, comparing them against her book. Happiness has a fractured right leg and fractured right arm and no plates or pins, so neither bone is set yet. If they start to mend, then Corrick will have to break them again and reset them. They are PEV victims too. The pace of terror is so fast now, we are distilling it down to acronyms, PEV, post-election violence. In bed 1S is Grace Gambeza from Mudzi. She's 29. She has septic hematoma on her back and buttocks and fractured arms. DW, says the chart, defense wounds. She also has a tiny baby that is still breastfeeding. The nurse brings her in, a bundle wrapped in a white hospital sheet, and tries to hold her to Grace's breast to feed. With two broken arms, Grace cannot hold her own baby to her breast. She weeps silently, her broken, unset arms lying uselessly at her sides as the nurse holds the crying baby to her breast and tries to get it to feed. Georgie looks up from her patient log, shakes her head, blinks rapidly, and takes off her glasses, pretending to clean them. Then, not trusting herself to talk, she turns on her heel and marches off to the next patient. Bed after bed, in ward after ward, on floor after floor, is filled with Mugabe's victims, a hospital full of those he has injured, tortured, and burnt out of their homes. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wish there were a better word than victims to describe what these people are. It seems so inert, so passive and weak, and that's not what they are at all. There is a dignity to their suffering, even as they tell me how they have fled, how they have hidden, how they have been humiliated and mocked. There is little self-pity here. Survivors, I suppose, defines them better. Again and again, as I play stenographer to their suffering, I offer to conceal their names or geographical districts to prevent them being identified. But again and again, they volunteer their names and make sure I spell them correctly. They are proud of their roles in all of this at the significance of their sacrifice, and they want it recorded. I shrink from generalizing what they have gone through, because it can feed into that sense that this is some undifferentiated, amorphous mass of third world peasantry, some generic, fungible freeze of suffering, one that animates briefly as you intersect with it, rubbernecking at it, a drive-by misery that disappears as you motor away over the horizon. 
and for the first time in trying to work out why I'm here and whether it's constructive, I find myself settling on a phrase I'd always avoided, a description I had found pretentious, but that now seems oddly apt, bearing witness. I'm bearing witness to what is happening here, to the sustained cruelty of it all. I have a responsibility to try to amplify the suffering, the sacrifice, so that it will not have happened in vain. <clears throat> Excuse me. There is no spontaneity to this evil. It is ordained from the top. It is hierarchical, planned, and plotted. Mugabe's men have even given it a name. They call it Operation Ngati Pedze Navo. Let us finish them off. Now, why this is important is that, um, and this to some extent is the law of unintended consequences, is that one of the main reasons when the exit packages were being discussed for Mugabe to leave office during this period that preceded this torture, um, one of the reasons that I think the generals decided not to go for it was that in the last five years, we've had various developments in international law, that, and we've had the creation and now the, 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 um, the coming into effect of the International Court for, of Criminal Justice, the ICC. We've got people like Charles Taylor going to The Hague, that international law, we, we, when, when crimes rise to a level of, um, of, of, of crimes against humanity, human rights abuse, it becomes completely international, and I think that a lot of these, um, I think a lot of these generals now, when they contemplate their own um, departure, they worry that actually they they will be sought after. And and in Zimbabwe, what's important, unlike say in Sierra Leone or Liberia, where a lot of this violence was was anarchic, small groups of people doing what they did. Um, and you'll, you'll see now with Charles Taylor um, in The Hague that the difficulties the prosecutors are having are showing that he gave orders that there was a chain of command because he's just saying, you know, he didn't have control and it was pretty anarchic. In Zimbabwe, that is not the case, absolutely not. Zimbabwe, in the way that it works, is much closer to being a fascist state. Things happen for a reason. Nothing is spontaneous. Um, <clears throat> What was happening, the idea behind the, 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 the idea behind the torture campaign now, and it's a sort of it's 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 rather sinister in a sense, is that it, there's this realization even among people like like the, the elite um, of Zanu PF, Robert Mugabe's party, that you no longer have to kill nine hundred thousand people, as happened in Rwanda, for example. You 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 don't have to commit genocide on that scale anymore. You you have this new this new this new concept in a sense, what they're calling what I started to hear being called politicide, which is that really you only need to kill the right two or three hundred people and torture a lot of the rest and to get to get the same aim to get this to the same point. So what they were doing with these people, they, were, they, were, they created torture bases in, in, in the schools, ironically, that were no longer operating. And they, they pushed tens of thousands of people through these things, beat them, flayed them alive, did all sorts of, uh, there was mass rape, they, did a, they carried out this torture called Falanga, which where you, you beat people on the soles of their feet um, until there was basically no, no skin left on the soles of their feet. Um, and then you release them. It's done, you know, to use an angling term, on a catch and release basis. And you release them, and they go back. I mean, these were the people we saw being pushed in the in the wheelbarrows, back to their home communities, and they function like human billboards, in effect, advertising the the cost, what you pay if you oppose the regime, if you oppose the dictator. This is what will happen to you, and and you're bearing this terrible political stigmata. And when you when you, when they got back to their home communities, they they set off these ripples of anxiety that people realized this was the price that you paid. Um, I want to read two other little bits to you, and then what I'd quite like to do is open it to questions and just respond to your um, to what you're interested in specifically. But one of the things th that happens when you do this kind of reporting is that h here I am living, you know, living a complete in a completely different world and a completely different life in Manhattan, 
and then going to Zimbabwe for two or three months and then coming back. And, and so I've tried to describe what, what that's like too, because it's, it's, a very, it's, it's a very strange existence trying to keep both of these things in your head and not going mad. Um, it's, it's, it's a strange, it's very strange and quite difficult to do. So I just wanted to give you a little window of what it was like when I got back from this particular trip. I struggle to compartmentalize my life. Shaken by what I have seen in Zimbabwe, I'm acutely grateful that my family is safe here in New York, that we aren't awoken by the shattering of glass, the reek of kerosene and the room in flames, that we don't have to run out into the night carrying our sons pursued by Mugabe's henchmen. But I feel guilty and ineffectual too, maudlin, distracted and angry. I find myself trembling for no reason, getting flashbacks to the parade of torture victims that lines the halls of my memory. Though I am no longer there to witness it, their misery continues. I want to hug my sons to me now, spend all my time with them. They can sense something changed in me. One morning, newly back, I'm playing with them on the bedroom floor. Hugo and I defending a wooden fort with a force of small plastic dinosaurs. Thomas is attacking us with large US soldiers. The rallying cry of our army of diminutive dinos is, we may be small, but we are many. To which Thomas's giant GIs retort, we may be few, but we are large. In the middle of the game, I reach to move a little T-Rex, and suddenly I see the little boy Samson Chemerani lying in hospital with his eye hanging out and the T-Rex picture that the nurses had taped to his medical chart to cheer him with the caption, the truth about killer dinosaurs. What is, asks Hugo, what's the truth about killer dinosaurs? Without realizing it, I have spoken aloud. I haven't told the boys much about Zimbabwe this time, nor have I shared the details with Joanna, who is just back from the Paris collections. When two worlds collide, I joke, couture versus torture. She suggests that I may be suffering from some form of PTSD by proxy. Now I tell Hugo a diluted version of Samson's story, how I met a little boy in Zimbabwe who had been hurt. But Hugo is at an incontinently curious age. He wants more detail. Did he cry, he demands? Yes. Can you run out of tears, he segues. I draw breath to answer, but he's already serially speculating. Do you have a little reservoir where tears are stored and when it's empty, you can't cry anymore? How does it fill up? Where do tears come from anyway? What are they made of? Did Alice really swim through her own tears in Wonderland? That night, he comes into our bedroom and tears himself. He has been awoken by a bad dream. I was kidnapped by a man in a snake suit, he sniffs. You've upset him with your war stories, Joanna chides. But then I woke up, says Hugo, rallying, and I realized it was just a fake life. A fake life. Maybe that's what I'm living, but which is my real life and which is my fake one? Zimbabwe seems so real when I'm there, but even while I'm there, I'm not really. Soon I leave and it fades into my past again. It reminds me of working as a foreign correspondent, shoulder to shoulder with photographers and cameramen how they become so integrated with their cameras, they feel they aren't really there in the flesh. You have to hurry them away as the danger grows. Hugo's bad dream, his first in ages, has come because his dream catcher is full, he reckons. His sleep used to be stalked by a malign character he calls the fat lady, who taunted him and threatened him, though didn't appear to do him actual bodily harm. But the bad dream stopped once he made us buy him a mohawk dream catcher from a farm stand in, the Green, in Green County in the Catskills. He hung it on his bedside light from its leather thong, a suede-bound willow ring with indigo beads strung on a twine web within it and feathered tassels twirling slowly below, and the fat lady went on sabbatical. My dream catcher needs to be emptied, he announces now, you have to shake it over running water. Apparently, you can't just release bad dreams into the air or they will escape and plague someone else. It's like Ghostbusters, he says, the way you have to store the captured ghosts in that special tank. So we walk down to the Hudson River 
and solemnly empty his bad dreams into its fast olive water. I wish it were that simple. I wish I could commit all the horrifying images and stories, things that will live with me forever now, into the dark currents as they slide swiftly under the twisted metal hulk of the old New York railway pier and have them borne away past Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty and out into the gelid gray sea. Thank you very much. Um, so if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And, um, and, then I'll and uh, please um, wait until you get the mic to put your question. First one here. Okay. Now, is the situation the same now as it was in 2008, or is it worse or better, or what? Um, it's, it's better insofar as what, what happened. I mean, I didn't necessarily want to delve straight into the geopolitics of it, but since you ask, I'll give you a brief up sum. Um, the 2000, what happened in the end in those 2008 elections was that they, there was a second round and the opposition was so beaten to a pulp that they withdrew. And so Mugabe declared himself the winner and that was that. And following, nobody, nobody recognized him. And eventually what happened was he was forced into a very uncomfortable so-called government of national unity where the opposition and the government are sitting in this hybrid transitional government and it's supposed to last for two years. It has already lasted two years, during which time a whole slate of reforms are supposed to be brought in, including a new constitution and leading up to a, a new free and fair election. Now, very, very few of those reforms have, in fact, been brought in. But, at, as we, but the main difference on the ground in Harare was that um, the, they abandoned the Zimbabwe dollar and the, and the hyperinflation that had been, this hyperinflation that was so bad that, that your, your money halved in value every 24 hours, that has gone because they just now, every, they've just turned to the US dollar. So at least there's a sort of vague stabilization in, on that front. So there are now things in the shops, but the problem is that most people are too poor to be able to afford them. Um, and we're sitting in this sort of uncomfortable position where nothing has been resolved, where n none of the, there hasn't been a free election and we're still waiting. And so, although all the, they're talking about going to new elections and whenever that happens, the, the rate of intimidation and, 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 and political intimidation um, rises and that's what we're seeing at the moment but having said that Mugabe is now 87 and and um, last week at a southern African summit in the city of Livingston um, by Victoria Falls um, he was for the first time I mean he's a very he's a very generally very um, healthy octogenarian in fact um, a friend of mine a student of mine was um, was on in the east side um, a couple of months ago when there was a UN plenary session. And the thing about, as I'm sure most of you know, the thing about the UN is it's not really in America. It's kind of international. So Fidel Castro and Hugo Chavez and whoever can come to them. And, and it's a bizarre thing. You have these situations where, you know, some, the CIA spends, you know, 11 months of the year trying to knock Fidel Castro off. And then for a week, they're in charge of his, uh, the, the Secret Service is in charge of his security at the UN to make sure nothing happens to him. So it's a, it's a very bizarre situation. Anyway, this, this student of mine was in a particular, particularly scuzzy subterranean branch of Dwayne Reed trying to get some Alka-Salsa or, you know, he was hung over Tylenol or whatever. And he looked up, and there was Robert Mugabe and, and one of his flunkies. And, they were, um, and they, were at the, they were at this wall of lipstick. And they were trying to pick... The flunky had a shopping list that Mugabe's wife, Grace, had clearly given him. And they were sort of both peering at the lipsticks and trying to figure out, and they were going, Mulberry? No. Well, they were going through these, the particular shade that they'd been told to buy. Anyway... Jonathan decided, you know, you always think that if you get that dictator, you know, you'd tell him a thing, a thing or two if you ever saw him. But of course, when you're confronted, you know, in real life with that, your social conditioning comes into play and you think, oh, yeah, I can't be rude to him or whatever. But so Jonathan steeled himself and so eventually went up to Mugabe and started, you know, 
ranting on and telling him what he thought of him and you know why wasn't he having free elections and one thing or another. And if this ever happens to you, if you ever happen to be on the east side of New York during a plenary session of the United Nations and, and, uh, and a dictator strolls into a shop you happen to be in, here are the rules of engagement, just so you know. As long as you stay three feet back, you don't shout or spit or in any way make sudden movements that look as though you're going to threaten the person, um, then you're, it's a free country and you're allowed to say what you want and the Secret Service have to let you do it um, for as long as you want. So Jonathan went on and on and eventually sort of ran out of things to say, but then remembered that he had his cell phone. So he then took, he took a picture of Mugabe and his flunky there, which he, which he emailed me at the end of this account. And the depressing thing about it was that in the picture, that Mugabe looks like a million bucks. You know, he's it's it's terribly lit. It's neon and whatever, and yet, you know, he looks he looks he looks great. Um, having said that, though, at Livingston, he he is he he was so ill that he had to go in a golf buggy, even you know, very short distances. And last week, he's back in Singapore. He's had prostate issues, and he's had cataracts and various other things, and he's got swollen limbs. And and so I suspect that he's now slowly. Um, you know, he's getting to a point where he certainly looks as though he would be incapacitated quite soon. It's very difficult to know what happens after him, though, because, you know, he's the only leader that Zimbabwe's ever had. He's been there for 31 years, um, and he's sucked all the political oxygen out of the room. Uh, and so, it, you know, it's possible that in the short term, things might actually get worse if he dies, because he's got various rivals within his own party that, you know, that, that, that may... Um, that may even it may even descend into some sort of civil conflict. So, so it's 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 hard to speculate as you know what would happen. Anyone else? Uh, it's not so much a question, Peter, but I am I'm born and bred Rhodesian, as you are. And I thank you for your three books because I think it's helped to enlighten a lot of people to a country that really a lot of people have no concept of what it's like. Um, and I think what you've brought to everybody is, unfortunately, it's a sad part, but I think in, in, in your books you've also shown us what a magnificently beautiful country that is. And I think more than anything, as you indicated earlier, the quality of the people are extraordinary. And I thank you for that, because I think reading these books, you get a true sense of what the people are, are really like. And from a very selfish point of view, I have loved every minute of them. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I mean, the problem, you know, one of the, one of the great tragedies of Zimbabwe is that, is that many, many of, the, of, of, of Zimbabweans have, have and are even now still leaving the country because of, because of the various difficulties. And so... You've got this enormous diaspora of very talented Zimbabweans um, of all races all over the world. And um, in this book, I also describe the, this period of z the xenophobic attacks that happened in South Africa in 2008 and that were um, the targets of which were um, other black African refugees in South Africa primarily Mozambicans, Nigerians, Somalis, but really mostly Zimbabweans because there are so many Zimbabweans there. But there was an interesting, and I was there for it, I came out of Zimbabwe just as it was happening, bizarrely, and arrived in Joburg in, in the middle of all of this. And there was a curious element to it, though, which was that it wasn't like normal... Um, r racial attacks, which are normally done by people who feel superior to the people they're attacking and look down at them. It felt more to me like anti-Semitism. It felt like it was based on envy and jealousy. And in many respects it was, because the Zimbabweans, um, it, the, Zimb the Zimbabwe diaspora, at all socioeconomic levels, tend to do very, very well. I mean, they've got the wolf at their back, like, like most immigrants and certainly most exiles, but they tend to, do, they tend to have a lot of initiative and do, very, and do very well. And in South Africa, certainly everybody notices that, that, that you see black Zimbabweans everywhere in, in all sorts of um, professions and jobs, you know, not, you know, from 
computer technicians, um, they run the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, basically. Um, so they, they, you know, they, they've done so enormously well elsewhere. And of course, the the great kind of question is that once Zimbabwe is re has democracy restored and and re returns to normality, it's difficult to know just how many of those people will go back because you know the longer they stay away, the more roots they put down you know, wherever they are, and the less likely they are to go back. And I've just spent the last two days with the Zimbabwean Minister of Finance, Tendai Biti, who I've written about in this book, who's the, who's the number two in the opposition. And he, he you know, he was, he was asked this question, it was, we were d doing a talk at Columbia together, and he was asked this question um, by some black Zimbabwean students about what what he would do to try and encourage the diaspora to return. And he said that in all the studies they've done and in, in the experience of everybody about trying to get diasporas to return, that, um, and they've done it in places like Ghana where they tried to get Ghanaian doctors to go back by offering them effectively Western salaries and things. He says it never works. They have to do it on their own. You can't, you can't do anything to entice them back. It's really... It's a sort of emotional thing as much as anything else. And that what tends to happen is that people often see out their careers in wherever they've settled. And then as they get to retire, they start getting more and more homesick and nostalgic and, and go back. But Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe depends very heavily at the moment on the remittances that these people are sending back. It's become very largely a remittance economy. And, and there's just one other sort of point to that I just wanted to make a... The, the slightly bleak thing that, you know, we've got Mugabe in it looking like he's not going to last too much longer. But one of the things that has really changed the situation there is the discovery in the last couple of years um, of what is now thought to be the biggest find of, um, of alluvial diamonds in history. Um, and it's... It's, um, it's in the east of the country, in Marangi. There's someone, in fact, there's someone here tonight here from that area. Um, it's in an area called Chiadzwa. And the amazing thing about alluvial diamonds, um, as I'm sure you know, is that, I mean, diamonds are normally in kimberlite pipes. And those pipes, you know, roughly correspond to the cores of, of, cores of ancient volcanoes, which have been heated to very high temperatures. But in alluvial diamonds, those, they've been disrupted by water courses, by, by tectonic shifts, by all sorts of things. And um, so they're scattered around on the surface or close to the surface. And you don't need to spend millions of dollars to dig down, you know, don't, you don't need to invest millions of dollars to dig down into mine shafts and things. And every single find of alluvial diamonds in history has resulted in a war. Um, because it's basically like if you went around New York City and threw $20 notes all over the sidewalks. I mean, that's the effect of it. And that's why the Kimberley process was brought in to try and prevent um, uh, blood diamonds from, from, from financing wars. But in Zimbabwe, what's happened is that those diamonds basically have... Uh, they, they, they are the exclusive property of ZANU-PF, of Mugabe's party, and they've got a Chinese company in with them, and, and the, the generals, the soldiers and the police have cordoned off the area. And so that has tended to revivify Mugabe's party, because suddenly, you know, in a nation of, 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 where the rulers are, are kleptocrats, and you steal everything, it's a looting economy. But eventually, if the economy is contracting, I mean, the con economy halved in less than 10 years, eventually there's nothing left to steal and it just sort of slows down. The kind of metabolism of theft slows down because there's nothing left to steal. But now suddenly they've literally got this glittering prize. I mean, we're talking about billions and billions of US dollars ultimately, but certainly even now, you know, hundreds of millions. And that's my great fear is that that will revivify the ruling party and, and make them, you know, more determined to hang on to power. Peter, can I ask a question? You've been writing and visiting, writing about Zimbabwe and um, and visiting Zimbabwe for more than thirty years now. I mean, right from right back into the early eighties. You you must be very well known there. How do they? How do they? Why do they let you in? Um, well, uh, you know, the, I'm not I'm not as well known as you might think, and part of that is because, <laughs> because books don't sell very well anywhere anymore, um, and least of all in a country where your money is not worth anything. So the truth is, and it's, and it's an important point, is that when you're, when you're looking at the 
electoral map, the electoral topography of of an African country in particular. What, what's important, I mean, very few people get to read books anyway. I mean, Zim, and Zimbab not because they can't, Zimbabwe is extremely literate, but they're very expensive, so that's difficult. Um, very few people can afford newspapers, and the real, the real action in terms of speaking to your electorate is done through radio. Radio is where it's all at. And one of the reforms that's supposed to happen in Zimbabwe is that um, they're supposed to be allowed independent radio stations. But as yet, the only radio, the only AM and FM radio that you can get is the state radio, Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation, which is slavishly pro Mugabe. Um, and it's, you know, there are several shortwave um, stations which are independent, but shortwave radios are much more expensive. And at one point, um, for example, the American embassy, in an attempt to um, you know, level the playing field, the electoral playing field, brought in uh, thousands and thousands of shortwave radios. And when Mugabe's thugs went around, if, if they found one of those shortwave radios in your house, they burnt your house down, but they stomped on the radios, or they broke the radios, because that's, and you can see that they understand how important that is. I mean, I, there are several instances in this book where I was recognized, but of course what you, what you have to realize is that, um, that a lot of the people in Zimbabwe, even you know, policemen and immigration officers and things, are actually opposition sympathizers. I mean, I had one particular incident, which I described in When a Crocodile Eats the Sun, where I sort of went through, I mean, I also don't necessarily go through, I don't necessarily want to talk about this, but I don't go through the obvious ways. And when I get there, I'm very quiet. I kind of just, I don't pop up on radio or TV or something, you know, shouting the odds. I'm very, very quiet while I'm there. Um, and in this particular instance, um, uh, I thought I'd slipped through, and just as I was, just as I'd gone through, you know, had my passport stamped and everything, I was going away, the immigration officer said to me, through the side of his mouth, he said, I know exactly who you are, and I thought, oh my God, and then, and then, he, and then he said, he said, oh, you know, thank you for your work or something, and so, and I kind of just, so, you know, but, but by and large, I just keep a very low profile, yes. Thank you. Thank you. I think we, we'll continue the conversation over uh, refreshments in the lobby and um, you have a chance to buy Peter's book.